I'd have to learn the spin. And um, the plan actually leaving high school was to kind of become a hammer thrower. So today's guest is a African Games champion, started out NCAA runner-up. Um, you are the African Games champion, the Commonwealth Games silver medalist, world finalist in 2019, world finalist at Tokyo. I know you wanted to boat place a little higher, but <laughs> okay. So, hey, thanks so much for coming in uh and, and attending the the interview um i uh i'm always excited to talk to uh talented young guys and you've had a very impressive career i i remember uh 2019 you had an amazing year that's i think probably one of your your biggest breakout years COVID obviously affected everybody it wasn't the the best situation clearly and it was tough right depending on where you were and restrictions and everything else um obviously you still uh, competed very well, you know, uh, were seventh in the qualifying at the Olympics, right. Going into the final. Yeah. Um, and that's a high pressure meet to say the least. And we'll kind of ask you some questions about that, but let's kind of take things back. Um, you know, obviously covering your, you in high school, mm -hmm. you were, what was your PR in high school? Uh, 62.4. Okay, so you and you were about five ten and two twenty. Are you have you gotten much taller since then? I have not gotten much taller. I'm about, <laughs> right now I'm about five eleven. Okay, and another guy I coached uh, in high school is Nick Ponzio, and Nick Ponzio has actually grown, believe it or not, since high school. So I think, but Nick is was always a, a big big guy. So um, so five ten. What do you currently weigh? Two eighty. 280. Okay. So in high school, you were 5'10 and about what, 220? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that definitely helps. Now I noticed that your pictures look fantastic. You look super jacked when we see you and when you're throwing. Um, so you're about 5'11 mm -hmm. and 280. Um, so in high school, you go 62, you get recruited, you go to Purdue and yep. had obviously had a, a, a modest first year, right? I think you were right about 16 meters or so yeah 16 26 in the shot okay and uh you know the that first year to the 16 is I, i've talked to a couple of other coaches and some guys i know and they said you know i i don't know anybody no matter how good they are that first year is always the toughest year you know <laughs> and um so from there you kind of the next year it looked like you jumped up right around what high 18 meters and in, yeah indoors 18 and then outdoors i had one meet at 1905 so the next few years obviously you kind of do with a lot of throwers you get to 19 that's a big jump and mm -hmm. you were working with coach mcbride at the time yep right and so and and from what i did looking at the research on you it looks like so he arrived when you arrived right so he he wasn't the coach who necessarily recruited you right but you show up and then he shows up and obviously talk a little about how that process was for you, you know, new coach. First of all, that happens a lot in the NCAA. People get recruited and mm -hmm. then maybe a coach, you know, he goes to and takes another job. So talk yeah. about how that kind of worked for you two. And then obviously you had a lot of success together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, McBride and I, like you said, showed up at the same time. Um, the coach that recruited me wound up having to leave. And um, after I got on campus, I kind of, I finally got to know that. And um, the track and field supervisor asked me to come into the office and meet my new throws coach, which, you know, again, I'm 18 years old. I'm like, I already met him. Like he took me on a visit and everything. So um, I come in and meet McBride and he kind of, Again, like we said, I'm, I was 5'10", 220 at the time. And he's like, kind of <laughs> looking me up and down and not too sure about what's going on. So, you know, he told me his goals for me, which were to throw um, over 58 feet as a senior in the shot put and um, 
70 feet in the weight and then over 65 in the hammer. And um, the thing about that was I wanted to quit the shot put because when I threw 62 four in high school, I was gliding. Uh-huh. So I'd have to learn the spin. And um, the plan actually leaving high school was to kind of become a hammer thrower. And we figured that the weight would be too heavy for me at that point. So I throw the weight indoors, you know, turn, turn, let it go to get ready for outdoors once I'm in college. But Coach McBride had the idea that if I'm throwing it, I got to throw it for real. So okay. if I'm throwing it, I got to throw the shot put for real. If I'm throwing the weight, I got to throw it for real. And I'm throwing the hammer, same thing. I got to throw it for real. So that shifted my focus a little bit. Then um, basically on Purdue's campus is where I started learning the spin. And that was the same time I started throwing a 16 pound ball. So things didn't go very well that first year, but I mean, we, we grinded that whole year and the plan was to be ready in 10 months after red shirting. And that's what happened. Yeah. So that first year, obviously it looks like you go 59 meters, roughly 59, 60, I think with the hammer <laughs> as a, and that's a, that's a pretty legit mark for a, for a freshman. Um, now it's, it's changed. It's amazing how much it's changed, even like the hammer and the shot, right. From the time you were in, you know, 62 feet is a great high school throw, but 62 feet in 2012 was a much better high school throw, you know, and nowadays it's just like the level of shot globally and especially in the U S right. It's just, it's insane. So going kind of talking about some of that, obviously, um, your hammer progressions, were pretty uh, in, impressive as well. And a lot of people may not know that obviously you've had, um, you know, a ton of success as a shot putter, uh, finalist at the Worlds in Doha. Again, um, you know, I mentioned this to Zane Weir. When you get eighth place, you didn't just get eighth place at the World Championships. It was like the best eight World Championships ever, right. right? Like the marks, the marks across the board, crazy deep, like, you know, the, the same thing. It, it's just been absolutely insane. So then um, you were fourth at the World Cup in 2018. And that's the Ostrava meet, which is always looks like a really cool meet. Yeah, it was, it was a fun one. Yeah. And I and I think that it's really cool. I'm going to just I'm living vicariously through through you and all these other guys because I love the places you get to go. Right. It's really cool. Um, so all African Games champion. Uh, Commonwealth, you got to go down to the Gold Coast in Australia and second there behind Tom Walsh. Obviously, kind of just taking a, a couple steps back, you grow up in the U.S. Your parents are from Nigeria. Yep. When did you kind of decide that, you know, because I think uh, a, a lot of throwers are, well, not a lot of throwers, but there's a number of throwers that kind of get in this situation. Do I, do I represent the U.S. or do I represent Nigeria? um or whatever country when did you start to one think about representing nigeria and then two you know what was the process like to actually make that decision and and do it yeah so um i thought i'd be able to go on to the professional level around my junior year in college or maybe a little bit before that and um, Coach Green, the head coach, was um, one of the Bahamian national coaches, and he had professionals. He worked with Veronica Campbell Brown, and mm-hmm. you know he he uh, Regina George. So he'd seen collegians make that leap, and to him it was a no-brainer. We had um, Chris Huffins on the staff, also as the jumps coach and the multis coach. Mm-hmm. He was an Olympic bronze medalist right. in 1996. So he kind of saw something in me, and then Coach McBride himself was with me through training daily. It was like you know, get your mind around <laughs> moving on from college to the professional level. So those talks were happening from like sophomore to junior year. Mm-hmm. And um, I think the conversation was, like you said, do you represent the U.S. or my parents, you know, home country of Nigeria? And we looked at America and at the time there were like five 21 meter guys, which we figured that's what it would take. And um, the hammer also, I was at 72 meters but i would need a three meter jump so we shifted the focus more to shot put later on and um we saw that america would not need me quite as much as nigeria would appreciate to have me um so it wasn't really a hard choice and i was born a nigerian citizen so i didn't do a bunch of like paperwork mm. and meet okay. stuff it was just like 
all right, cool. I have two passports. Let me use this one. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it was pretty, it was, it was definitely uh, a little easier transition. So <laughs> now, you know, I'm going to take it one step back. You mentioned too, with it, when my bride met you, kind of looked you up and down, you're this 5'10", 220 guy. Um, I'm sure you were pretty low body fat and Jack 220 though, right? As, yeah. Especially if you're throwing 62 in the glide, that's a, that's an impressive glide. When he says to you, you know, the goal is to get you to throw 58 feet by the time you're a senior. One, what's immediately in your head and you're thinking good or are you thinking, man, I'm going to throw a hell of a lot farther than 58 feet? No, um, I wanted to be done with the shot put. Oh, I, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it's not I didn't like the event. It's So my coach in high school was um, Jean-Joseph Roman and he was a Frenchman, but he was raised in the Ukraine. And um, he only knew the linear technique all he did was glide and okay. the way i glided was pretty much european it was you know short long wide base stuff like that that's not really applicable to the rotation so I, my mind was pretty much crystallized on like that's how i could get the ball the farthest and the 16 would not you know i, I couldn't do anything with the 16 right. that was my 18 year old brain you know thinking that especially after throwing 19 you know in high school so I was ready to be done with it. And Coach McBride is like, hey, I want you to throw over 58 feet. So he's probably thinking 60, but didn't want to scare me. Right. And I'm like, how the hell? I can't throw this thing 50 feet. So um, it it shocked me. And I, I kind of left that meeting um, a little bit spooked because then I had to, you know, I'm here now. It's a real thing. My recruiting process was really short. So, you know, basically everything was thrown at me super fast, including some of those big boy goals. So left me a little bit spooked, but um, I think it was up to me to figure out, you know, how to get my mind around it. And, you know, Monday was practice. So. So that's cool. Now that said, so hammer was really kind of your, your real love then. Yeah. And that, that's another thing. So the reason I picked up the weight was so I can throw the hammer in high school. Okay. So, Coach looked at me and was like, my high school coach looked at me and was like, look, you're you're a small guy, but you have a lot of like good attributes. So you'd probably be a hammer guy eventually. But if you look at my high school um, rundown, I threw it for one season. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So okay. I wouldn't say I love, but it was kind of what I was groomed towards. Gotcha. Okay. So then obviously as you're, you and coach McBride start working together and um, you start to make the jump. You go to 19 meters now, right? So you redshirted your first year. Yep. So 2013, you hit a PR of 19, but you had been kind of averaging, it looks like in the 17 meter range. And then mm -hmm. boom, you hit the nice, you hit the big jump. Talk about that. That's always the that's always a really great moment when you're kind of like hitting and hitting and all of a sudden it's not just a PR. It's a pretty significant, it's like a meter and a half PR. Yeah. So, um, it was kind of a rough outdoor season up to that point. And I think it happens to everybody like every year, it doesn't matter your um, talent level where you transition from the big plastic ball and the wooden rings to right. the metal, all that, all that stuff. So this was the first time I'd seen that as a collegiate athlete or, you know, throwing a 16 pounder, it actually kind of just clicked right now, but, um, cause I'm doing it right now with the, you know, with my season, but anyway, um, so that transition was a little bit jarring compared to like doing it with the glide, um, as a high schooler. So if you look at indoors, I was still, I was throwing 18s and stuff like that. And I had 61, eight or so be my season best, like 1866. But then that transition outdoor was harder than I imagined. Um, but it was after the big 10 meet where I didn't make the final, but I was watching some of the discus guys. So we had Dan block from Wisconsin mm. and Chad Wright from Nebraska. And these guys were bigger guys, you know, um, and they were discus throwers, but they also threw shot put. Right. And in order to hold themselves in the ring, they used more rap than a lot of us shot putters would do transitioning from that eight foot ring to the seven foot ring. So I, and I mean, Coach McBride had mentioned separation the past two years, but I had never seen it to that degree, especially mm -hmm. at a championship meet where I'm trying to do my best to score. So I kind of 
took that and like dove in head first at practices, like trying to use more and more rap. Okay. And I think it was like a couple weeks span from conference to the regional meet where I put the rap into where I can use it and be powerful on my strike. And all of a sudden I started training at 18 again. Okay. Then every throw was like 60 feet and all that was coming up was regionals. So open up with like 1866 and then 1876 and then the 1905. And that was the big difference for me. It's like, I was, even when I was throwing indoors, I was pretty stiff because I couldn't understand what I was supposed to do. Um, and then when I saw some of the bigger guys really use that rap, gotcha. uh, put it into play. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, I had kind of brushed over it. You, you had a, you had a really good indoor season mm -hmm. and then obviously outdoor was the rougher transition. Like, what do you do yeah. when you've been throwing 60 feet and then all of a sudden you throw, you know, 1685. So now you're throwing 54 feet. Mm -hmm. Right. And then how do you, what do you do? And that was one of my questions that I had lined up for most of the throwers, you know, when you hit these roadblocks and this is when you're a younger guy right because now i'm sure you can reflect on your older more experienced you've competed internationally you competed at the worlds you competed at the olympics i mean you are like one of the premier dudes now um looking back at that when you're talking to a younger guy or a coach what do you do where's your mindset when you're like i've been throwing 60 feet i come up i'm throwing 54 55 and change how you know that's what i would definitely call right? You get into a little slump. It's going to happen to every thrower at every point. What do you do to get yourself out of that slump? And what, is you, what do you and your coach do to get out of that slump? Yeah, so that a coach is very valuable, I think, in letting you know that things are okay. Um, but I think a good tool is like, especially now in the age of social media, um, people tend to record more and store more videos and, you know, things like that. So I think it's a useful tool if you have some of those training videos and stuff. And that's why all the videos I post are just training tools. It's the ones that look the prettiest. I'll post them online. Right. But um, look back at some of those good days and understand that, you know, two weeks ago you were firing. Right. And then now you may not, you're, you're in a slump. Um, understand that your body didn't change very much in that two weeks. All that's happening is maybe you're not hitting quite as clean as you've been doing or you're not executing as well as you've been doing. Right. But it's something that physically you still can do. And I think it's easy to say that, but having some of those tools, like the maybe a training log or mm -hmm. you know some videos from practice, would really help, especially a younger thrower. Now, what do you do from a mental standpoint? You know, your coach helps you through, and then I'll kind of lead this into a little bit about talking a little bit more about kind of your progression and again how you and Coach McBride work together. Because I think when I was doing my research on you, you you again you have this year you you have, you have, you just get progressively better and better and the distances are going up, but then come your senior year, here comes another big jump. And mm -hmm. what did you guys change to make that jump? So, um, when I started throwing 20, that a lot of that was mental. And it was the idea of, again, we had a conversation with coach McBride and I, um, about the Olympics coming up that senior year. So that was 2016 and we reassessed everything. So at the time when the shot put, I'm throwing 19, 40s 1950 there about in the hammer i'm at 72 high and to be an olympic shot putter you needed 2050 which is about one meter versus 75 meters in the hammer right which you know is like it's two plus meters and it would be easier it sounds funny but it would be easier to get one meter um in the shot put as opposed to several meters in the hammer um so what we did was we just got bigger and stronger and um, and then we just we dialed in the mechanics a little bit. So mm -hmm. um, you, you might be able to see like a bigger sweep out of the back. Um, I really don't have very level shoulders, but more level than in the previous years. And then we emphasize the strike at the end. So a lot of half turns, better half turns. And um, we just we basically took shot, but I wouldn't say more seriously, but we focused more on that as opposed to focusing more on the hammer. So even as I was throwing the weight, we'd be geared more towards the hammer outdoors and stuff like that like that was the premier event we just flip-flopped it so shop it became the premier event while not um letting the hammer and weight go completely right so now that year obviously um 
you wind up second at the NCAA championships. You get on a really pretty nice hot streak regionals. You're like 2020, you hit another, which I think at the time was your, you had tied your PR, right? It was 2037 your PR. So then you, you're second, you hit that. And then um, you got another like relatively local regional meet. And then it's um, USATF. There's some other open meet, right? And you go 2045. At this point, I'm assuming um, you were trying to, chase the Olympic standard, right? Yeah. And you fell what? It was five centimeters short that year? Yep, exactly. Five that, centimeters short, yeah. That's got to be really disappointing. <laughs> it, it was a heartbreaker, you know, just, yeah, it, it was it was tough. But it was one of those things where I gave it everything I had. And um, I'm also, I'm pretty proud of myself with how I, I took everything. So my focus was the shot put obviously, but I still wanted to throw the weight far. I still wanted to throw the hammer far. Mm -hmm. And especially on the team, I think the kids need to understand that like you're playing a part. So you have your personal goals, but at the end of the day, especially if you're on scholarship or anything like that, like you still have to produce for the team. Right. And I did a pretty good job of producing for the team, uh, like several medals at the conference meet and stuff like that. Right. But what there's eight to 10 points, you know? And, um, after that was all said and done, that chase for the standard was like two weeks okay. where it was like just me time trying to get it. And uh, I got within five centimeters, but at the time I was bitter. Like I, I wanted to quit the sport, but I talked with my parents and like I was back next fall. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. So you were just like super young, disappointed guy. Cause really you came off your second at the NCAAs. I think you were a uh, big 10 field athlete of the year right because you had yeah. won the hammer and and you were only one of i think two athletes at the ncaa's that was actually throwing the shot and the hammer yeah unbelievable right. uh shout out to um denzel coming in yeah he won both right uh, later on but they changed the format so they they used to mix up the events and try to make them as um accessible for you know big teams but then they started to go by gender so it's like several men's events, then several women's events, then several men's events and hammer and shot wound up on the same day. And I think the rationale was that like, it's not a common double, right? That was the year when they started to put them like hammers in the early afternoon and shot put as a few hours later. And that was a hard, hard double. Yeah. That, that is definitely impressive. Again, knowing that you, uh, you threw 2037. What do you think you would have thrown had you not thrown the hammer a few hours before? 2050. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I figured. No, I, I thought about that and I, I'm also, I, I look at when I threw it. I was in the last round. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was, it was kind of like a guts, you know, like a gut check performance kind of thing. Um, but I was happy with it. You know, coach was happy with it at the time. And, um, but I do think the hammer took something out of me. And the reason I say so is that, um, I started to cramp right at, like in the warmups of the shot put mm. and that's Oregon sun for hours. Like, you know, right. and um, you really couldn't avoid that. So I started to cramp. And then on the very last one, even like to save it, like it was a struggle, but I happened to, <laughs> I saw myself was in the ring at the very end of it. And then I'm jumping and celebrating at the end. But um, yeah. I, I think I would have went a little bit farther. Like, I don't think it's out of the realm to, to imagine 2050 or so. Right. Those extra, yeah, 13 centimeters is probably easy to obtain with some, with a fresh uncramping body. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In 2016, you actually, it looked like that was your first year internationally. You went over to Nigeria, went to the national championships and you were the Nigerian champ, right? Yeah. And so how was it? So at this point, you know, are you, you're second at NCs. I remember, God, what was it? It was at 2019. It was 2019. And I think USA's were in Des Moines. And a good friend of mine is uh, Doug Reynolds. He's a coach now at Florida State. He was at Bama, was a head coach over at New Mexico. So I'm sitting down with him, Rachel Dinkoff, and then Josh out with two days sitting and we're at that barbecue joint, you know, that famous barbecue joint in Des Moines. 
Yeah. And I remember having him just talking with his coach because he had just had a, a, an amazing year and he was looking about turning pro and doing all that. So for you kind of in that situation, you're, you're a few years older. So now it's 2016. And is this when you said, had you already decided that you were going to represent Nigeria at that point, or was that like still kind of, uh, you know, making decision, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, I was, I was sure by that point, I was pretty certain. Okay. That, uh, the, the transition, but yeah, we went to that meet. Josh and I went and um, I don't care how he says it. We both went and we both quit. And then I came back to Nigeria and then he came back to America. Okay. He Cause was he so was, he was considering that, right? Yeah. 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 But he like the meat was so bad. I saw him actually last summer. Uh, we did a couple of meets together in Europe and it was, it was so bad. Like it, it's hard to explain it. Like the, the ring looked like the surface of Mars, like craters everywhere. Wow. They waited till it started to downpour in the rain before the comp even started. Like it was, it was an awful meet and okay. neither of us had to show like what we were capable of. So like we were frustrated and embarrassed a little bit. And um, yeah, but at that point we were both done. <laughs> and then, you know, he, he came back and, but he was still in college. He had another year of um, college left. So I had a good year. And then after that, went to the training center. And then, um, yeah, I just, I came back and um, kept representing Nigeria. Right. And I'd read a little bit, you know, kind of, again, when we're looking things up, it, that it looks like there are definitely some challenges with, you know, some of the federation. So talk about like, um, you know, it just looks like, like I said, I'd read there just some different things like speed bumps, if you will. And then, um, so what, uh, you know, so you both quit and then you decide to come back. So what made you come back? And clearly, you know, you're all over the world now, which has got to be a really cool thing. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Just that, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize there is an actual pro circuit for throwers, you know, and track and field in general, but it's clearly internationally based. I mean, there's only a few really pro meets in the U S and everything is all over it. Now, as you're, uh, as a Nigerian athlete, you're getting to probably hit more meets in Africa, right. Hitting different countries. And then obviously that's part of the Commonwealth. So you, that includes the Commonwealth games. So you decide to go back. How, how has it been to be representing Nigeria? Um, well, it is decent. It, like you said, there are some, some road bumps along the way and stuff. And, um, it's, it's a third world country. So track is not really a big priority. Like, whereas in the U S, um, it's very important how well the athletes do. And it's not just in saying that it's in the preparation. So you have things like financial support, you have camps, you have um, teams that bring coaches overseas and things like that, that um, facilitate the biggest performances, especially when they count. So, you know, with our team, you don't really see that quite as much. Um, the talent is definitely there, but you know, right. some of the infrastructure may, you know, may need a little bit of work. Right. But as far as like represent Nigeria, you know, I am proud. That's, that's my parents' home country. Um, and I've always wanted to do it. You know, my first name is Chukwebuka. My last name is Anekwuchi. A lot of people ask me why I represent Nigeria. And I'm like, well, can you pronounce my name? Right? Like, <laughs> if my name was like John Williams or something, like, it would be obvious why I'd represent the U.S. But it's right. like, I am full-blooded Nigerian. And I just thought, like, it'd be a good tribute to my parents, my family, you know, if I were to use my talents where they would be, I think, needed is a weird word but like i guess more appreciated whereas america just churns out the 21 meter plus throwers the 70 footers and it, you know like nigeria doesn't quite have that factory quite yet so right. i thought i'd be, i'd make more of a difference here than i did there you know cool but, and and um and i know this is a really big question but um let's see let me preface it with if i research this correctly you're the first nigerian athlete to make the men's shot put final at the olympics is that correct yeah yeah, yeah. i mean 
that's a that's that's a hell of a you know accomplishment and there's been some really great throwers i know discus wise there's been some really phenomenal throwers wasn't it um was it christian okoye wasn't he and remember him he was a pro football player but he was a thrower too yeah yeah so you know uh the nigerian nightmare right wasn't it like that or something like that and uh uh, played in the NFL and all that. But so ha, do you think uh, with that kind of attention, has it brought more attention to throwing in Nigeria? I would hope so. Um, throwing is not huge in Nigeria, unfortunately. The sprint events are the more premier events. And then um, the jumps come second. Like throwing is like a distant, you know, redheaded stepchild. So I think, I think in America, it's brought more attention which is a great thing um, for athletes that are kind of in my situation where you're a dual citizen and you look at an opportunity to represent your parents' home country. But as far as like in Nigeria itself, like, you know, it's a developing country. So I think there's more important things to worry about than athletics. Gotcha. Okay. That's a fair, fair answer. (laughs) Okay. So now let's talk about uh, when you get into like 2018, Um, this is when, again, another big jump, and this is where you were really pretty consistent 2018 and 2019. I remember Mm -hmm. posting different things on our Instagram on, on you all over the place. And, uh, I think, you know, that's when it was like, damn, this guy's really, really on fire. Um, you have a good, a really good 2018, but 2019, I would say is definitely that big jump, right? 2180, you're like, strongly what we're, we're, we're pushing 72 feet at that point. And, and I just remember everywhere you were going, it was like 70 feet, 70 feet, like you were just crushing. Yeah. So how, how, what, um, at this point, um, when did you and coach McBride, cause coach McBride took, right. I mean, he's got his career and he has to move on. I think he went to Kentucky. Right. And so how did, um, you know, kind of what transpires at that point is that the first year like you got was it 2018 that he took the Kentucky job yeah okay so he goes there in the fall and then that next year were you guys still working remotely did you work in Kentucky for a little bit or is at that point that you kind of just started you know kind of taking charge of your own training and whatnot uh yeah so he left um and I stayed in West Lafayette and the new coach, Jermaine Jones, came in um, at the end of the year and like dead in the summer. And um, we immediately started working together. OK. And so would how did you know? So, again, all through this point, you're just getting bigger and stronger. Right. You're getting, you know, bigger and stronger. He didn't get taller. Right. <laughs> and that was one of the things I learned. I was like, damn, this guy's you know, it's really impressive, obviously. Um, speed and strength have to be what you have to harness. If you're not tall, you're going to have to be faster. So, um, how did you guys, you know, what, is it just the logical progression of training or what kind of technical changes start to, you know, occur at that point? Yeah, uh, that was most of it. Um, just the logical progression, getting bigger, getting stronger. Um, and then just like I did with coach McBride throughout college, where we, paid more attention to the fundamentals you know um if you're rotating rotate properly be more efficient through the technique we just continue that progression with um, jermaine jones and um more emphasis on things like a south african for like linear drive um and then i also took more volume of non-reverse throwing so i can find the ground and um, try to use that more to my advantage because being a smaller thrower, I tend to be like a little bit jumpy through positions. And I still do that till today. Right. And I think more volume with non-reverse throwing helps kind of dial that in and, you know, work from the ground up and really transfer as much force as I could. So those, I think were the two big changes, but like, it just, it was a continuation, a continuation of what I've been doing since uh, college. Good. So I love the fact that you say fundamentals, because obviously for people who are watching, there's going to be coaches and they think, I have found, you know, it's almost like it's the, like the perfection of the fundamentals, right? That's really like, you're so good fundamentally. That's what takes you to that next level. It's not some big secret. I mean, clearly to throw, 
the 16 pound shot, the strength requirements to be able to move fast and transfer your speed to the implement is, is really critical. And strength is going to be a, a, a major variable, but there's plenty of guys that are really strong and they can't throw that far because they don't have the technique. So, um, so I, I just, as a coach, love the fact that you say that now you're also coaching. Is that correct? Are you still coaching? Yeah, so I volunteer at Purdue still. So I work with the kids. I've worked with the kids since um, like 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also coach at the local high school. Okay. And how do you find that working with, have you found that being a coach yourself has benefited you as an athlete? <sighs> Ideally, it would. <laughs> The problem is the amount of hours. Yes, minus that. Uh, just we'll take the context because, yes, being on your feet, being somewhere and having to put that time in is definitely a deterrent to, you know, it's a, you know, it, it hits you a little bit on your performance and your training. But yeah. from the standpoint of having to go through the technique and relay the technique, has that process helped you as, an, as a thrower? I, I think it has because um, – you can learn a lot by teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where you're getting that. And I've seen that um, firsthand. So the, the other part of it is um, it, it works both ways. So now whatever I tell the kids to do, it's something that I've done at some stage of my career. Right. Vice versa. And sometimes you forget, you know, like, I guess you forget some of the things that you should keep in contact with. And working with novice athletes or athletes that need to be told and reminded can remind you of things that you'd worked on in the past. So I think that link, like it's, it's almost like a two-way relationship. And yeah. I have experienced that. So good. Yeah. Probably yeah. I would, I, I think the fundamentals, you know, I've, it's always interesting um, that, you know, I've found, I've obviously I've worked with my, my open guys that are going to like U S championships and stuff. And that's what I always find is the difference. I have, I've had experience with certain athletes where they were like, okay, I totally get it. And then there's guys, well, I think I need to be doing something else. It can't be that simple. And it's like, no, it really is that simple. And you're not doing that simple thing very well. And that's why I'm having you do it. And sometimes that works out. And sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, I got to go find something else. And it's like, fundamentally, you're off, you're out of position and it's funny that, uh, and so I'm glad to hear you say that because I think that is such a critical thing. So this probably, there's probably been better throws. This was one of your throws from um, the Olympics. Okay. Yeah. So this is, so here's, first of all, you kind of are familiar with our six pillar system. So this mm -hmm. is what we do. And a lot of people don't totally understand our system, which clearly I got to do a better job as a business, <laughs> but um, so, cause some people say, oh, it's a, it's a factory and they're trying to make everybody throw the same. It's like, no, what it is, is it's a way of looking at something that happens really fast, teaching the core fundamental mechanics. And then our six pillars are about assessing those and then finding an individual formula. So the system's actually about how to create an unlimited number of combinations to help all kinds of athletes. So it teaches and, and then it helps create a personal formula. So that's what it is. So this is what we do. And we just say generally from a mechanical standpoint, um, these are the things. So we call pillar one, we're setting everything up. You're wind up, you know, to get to that point, um, <clears throat> we're looking at level shoulders, hips, locking up, right, to create that torque and tension. So there's a lot of really important things. A wind up isn't just an arbitrary movement. It's setting up the whole path. So this is our pillar one. So we go to pillar two. Now here, the pillar two. So we go here, we call this pillar three. That's where we drop it in and applying speed. It looks <clears> like, right, you were kind of cutting a little short. This was at the Olympics. Okay, so pillar four is the transition where we're going to be looking at to get that wrap in place, right? We want to try to stay as level as possible, especially I feel like in the shot put. If you get that <clears> elbow up, you're tilting the axis, right? You're not going to rotate as fast into the finish. So when we did the here, we move to pillar five. That's what we call locking down power. The start of the power position. We break the power position into two points because we're going to kind of set it up and we don't want to start throwing too early. We want to be able to move into the finish. And then that's your pillar six. And that's where we want to try to stay level, try to stay on the ground longer, like you said. And, uh, you know, 
And then obviously, as we come through, we'll just have our recovery. What tell us about your throw? I'll kind of do it. That's like I said, the six pillars for us are, and again, we'll teach it and we're going to teach the core positions and we're going to look at positions because I always say throwing truthfully really is an unnatural sport. And then the idea is to put the motion together and make it fluid. And so you train parts and then you put it all together and make it flow. And that's kind of how we address it. So for you, what are some of the key technical points of your throw? So what do you think about in the start? Do you have any specific processes going through your head? And if you were like communicating to young athletes, what would you say? In the back of the ring, um, I'm trying to get weight over to the left leg. Right. So even I'm winding up, I'm thinking about loading up the left leg. So you're trying to load right here. Right. Thinking about putting it. Yeah. Yeah. And then at this point, I always call this the entry. So for us, we really think about, we want to create a big hinge and a long radius with the left. What, what do you think about at this stage of the throw? Yeah. So it's mostly about an efficient left side. So get most of my mass out to the left and open the left arm as wide as I can so that the right leg follows. <clears throat> now, when you think of the speed section, this is where we call it drop it in speed. Obviously, I'm assuming that's kind of what, what do you think about here? Are you actively driving off your left? And then, you know, how do you think about your sweep and your balance arm at this point? So that, that changes um, with, I guess, my health because I deal with, some pretty bad sciatica that's mm. actually happened to yesterday morning and um it used to be a big part of my throw to drive hard off the left to create that speed but in recent years i had to use more of the right leg to get myself out of the back of the ring so um it kind of changes sometimes the left hip will feel okay and then i drive hard and i can create more speed but um in recent years it's been more about getting the right around and just getting the left back down to the front. Gotcha. And so you talked earlier on about, you know, one of the big points when your technique started to jump up was the wrap. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting. You know, I interviewed Zane Weir and he was like, I go, he has a really nice wrap. And, uh, and I was like, what do you, you know, what does he think about? It? He's like, I just feel it. And I was like, that's a perfect example of guys who are just really talented right and i was trying to point out like this guy's clearly extremely talented because he's super feeling based and a lot of people just don't have that um i think all of you guys that are at this level the top 20 guys in the world in the men's shot or any of the events for that matter all have that ability to feel some probably a little bit more than others for you talking about like your rap here it looks like like this looks like might have been part of the issue. You were a little off balance here. And then so the wrap wasn't as dynamic. Would, would you agree with that? No, I was really dehydrated at that meet. Ah. Be, yeah, this, like I wasn't at good health in this meet. Okay. So I don't, it, it wouldn't be of too much value to <laughs> break down this particular throw. Okay. So in general, though, when you have, um, do you, when you focus on the wrap, do <clears> you, is it, are you, what's your thought process on that? We'll just forget that this wasn't a great throw, but just generally speaking, how do you like, what are you trying to, you know, think about? And you kind of touched on a little bit earlier, but I just kind of curious. And Yeah. So I'm just, um, I try to set up the separation out of the back and I want to lead in with the right. And the main thing I'll do is lead in with the right. When the right makes contact, get the left down ASAP. So whatever difference in the angle of the shoulders and the hips, I want to maintain that. I don't really work on adding more through the middle. Okay. Maintain what I establish out of the back. Gotcha. And then, so for you, what do you like to think about through the finish? Well, as soon as I land, I want a strong um, a left side. So I kind of split my body in two um, vertically. So I want to get the left side super strong and then work down to the ground and then the right rotates forward. And right. then those things will give me a little bit more of a natural trajectory on the ball. So you were dehydrated and this is a really important point. You know, you, yeah. 
you came out in the qualifying. How did you feel in the qualifying? You had a pretty decent throw, 21-16, I believe. Yeah, I felt great in qualifying. But um, some weird stuff happened with the team camp. Where, so that the qualifying was on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, you know, I'm, I'm in meetings. I'm walking up and down Tokyo and stuff. Had to address this person, address that person. And um, the Tokyo sun is like 94 degrees, like daily oh, from... Wow. 4 30 a.m all the way to the evening and um just on my feet all day trying to get a uniform to wear and stuff like that so there was a whole bunch of like bullshit that I had to kind of deal with on the wednesday and then when i woke up on thursday i was like yeah that's it's gonna be a rough one gotcha so and you know those are the things that people i remember um years ago so i'm old and there was a legendary throws coach, you know, Art Venegas. So Art was my, my college coach for a few years. I was a small skinny guy. Right. And uh, so I wound up going to a Juco and then there. So I, and when I was coaching with Art, I remember looking at meets and, you know, you would see some results and they were kind of like down and then people, you know, kids on the team, somebody would say, Oh, you know, I could have done this or that. And then I just remember, it was just one of those weird things your coach says, and you kind of remember And Art's like, unless you're at that meet, and you don't, you know, if you're not there, you don't know what's transpired. So you don't know why those marks are where they are. And if they're down across the board, there's probably something that's influencing everybody. And then you just never know what's going on with that particular athlete. And it was always a, just a really quick, insightful thing. Like, and that's a perfect example. So people see you have a, you had a good qualifying and then, you know, you qualified seventh and then the next day, you're dehydrated, which would explain why I think you're, you had a, I think a, what, uh, a foul on your first throw you had a, and then you had a couple of okay throws and that would kind of fall in line. Still, it's nice to know that you were at the Olympic final, you know, and that that's a hell of an accomplishment. So going back to like Doha, um, and you were eighth in Doha, um, how was that competition? And obviously you had uh, a good qualifying and a good final. So talk a little bit about, you know, that a lot of people don't understand like the championship meets are really high stress, like qualifying is high stress. You have an auto standard. Uh, I remember, you know, I was talking to Joe uh, Kovacs and he, he said on a couple of different occasions, like he, he hates the qualifying day, right? It's like, once that's over, it's like, then you can actually like let it loose But talk about that. When you go to Doha, it's your first world championship. And, you know, it's obviously a hell of a world championship, right? I mean, so talk about qualifying and then talk about what it's like to be in the final. Yeah, um, the qualifying, we knew the rules. So the plan was for a little bit better. That mark came out. They said um, they wanted 2090, which I thought was far and it was like, you do it or you don't that kind of thing so I went there with the idea of throwing 21 meters any given day and um it just it lined up that way so um it was high pressure but at the same time like I was pretty confident at that point especially with the year leading up to it that like within three throws I could throw 21 meters Mm -hmm. um And then, you know, it's the meet was so late. It was October. So it wasn't like I was messing with the technique or anything like that. Right. So I think those factors um, worked in my favor. And the other thing was um, it it was kind of um, lower pressure because we already had the African um, games and all that stuff. So it was like just another championship, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you, you you practice competing by competing. And I just competed so much at that point. Like it's the world huge, but it was just another one at that point. Gotcha. So, and, and when you get to the final, you, you go, uh, you open up well, 21, 18. So like what goes through your head at that point? You're like, Oh yeah. Like I'm feeling good or, and, and then, you know, looking at it as well, um, you have Joe, you know, or was it Tom Walsh, right? Wasn't it his first throw that he went 22 90? Yeah. So what do you think at that point? Like, what's it like to be at that point where you like, you're with those guys, but at the same time, yeah. like this guy, it's like, what the hell, right? That's like huge. 
Yeah. So um, I think any of us are trying to get our best throw um, in that moment. So, you know, if Philip from Croatia threw 30 meters, it's like you're still trying to get your own yeah. good. So um, I think after the fact, like, you know, you'd sit around and you see it's like, yeah, that was a good comp. But in the moment, you're just like, OK, got to get the next one. Got to get right. the next one. Yeah. So it was cool because, you know, we're shot put is huge right now, but it's kind of weird because like nobody cares at the same time. Whereas like somebody can run a decent 60 and get the most press, you know, that you don't right. you see in the court. So it was cool that what we were doing was getting a lot of attention in that, um, that stadium. Yeah. And it just, it kind of shows you how much has to happen for anybody to give a crap. And that's, you know, three, 75 foot throws and like every single throw in the final above 21 meters and it's like it's good but at the same time it's like damn like so so what does the crowd want now you know what i mean right so it's it's a mixed basket so it was exciting like to be a part of the best shot comp ever yeah it's like damn like 75 and it's like okay good job i think that was pretty far so like, right what's next? right now you're at the point where it's like, okay, so that guy threw, like, was it a world record or not? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Meanwhile, decent 100 or 200 gets a lot of love, so. Just... Yeah, no, that's, and then, uh, I mean, that's partially why we do what we do, which, you know, that's a big part. Obviously, I have a coaching system that's designed to help more coaches and athletes learn, which we're, we're doing a, a better and better job of, you know, we've got thousands of athletes around the world now that are getting coached using our stuff and we've helped a lot of guys become really amazing coaches it's really a cool thing to see but obviously um it's just kind of the the era right i think there is more information but yep. we need to get more exposure what do you think would bring more exposure to the sport I, at this point because i i'm uh, i'm six years in uh-huh i don't um, I really don't know. I think it's just, I think it's over with. I don't know. It, it's, it's hard to say. Cause like a lot of people are thinking maybe it's a world record and it's like, like that hasn't done it. And, um, the level of talent is through the roof now amongst my peers. And like that hasn't done it. Changing the rules of the, the events is not going to do it. That's no. not help it. So I think more exposure. Okay. Uh, you know, it's going to sound very basic, but more advertising. Yeah, no, that's, it's more that's, exposure. Yeah. Were you, you were in um, Zagreb too, weren't you? Yeah. And how's that? That meet looks really awesome. Yeah, it's a fun meet. It's, um, it's at night. So uh, those meets tend to be a lot more fun. The crowd is, I mean, right up against the ring. So um, you get a lot of interaction and stuff. Unfortunately, it was pouring rain when I went, but it was still a fun meet. I still, I threw like twenty ninety five. Like the rain, was, that's a nice throw. And um, at the end, we have this big like lamb dinner. Oh, so nice. like all the throwers, um, the donors, and everybody gets together, meet directors, and we sit and just have a good time. So oh, that, that's awesome. That's fun meets I've been to. Very cool. Okay, so strength numbers. Everybody wants to know. This is the meathead part of the interview. How how much you bench? Bench, my best bench is uh 525. Okay. Yeah, the, I mean I, sw I swear to god it's like everybody can bench 500 pounds now. It's like unbelievable. Except Ryan, right? Uh no, he's he's well into the fives. Is, is he well into the fives? I should probably yeah. know. Yeah. Is he uh, who, who is it uh Joe's the freak, right? J yeah, Joe and Romani. Those are the guys I that mean, are over six i mean joe and romani are just like giant right i mean joe is just like he's such a like he's not the tallest guy right i think joe said he's 5 11 you guys are probably about the same height i think joe said he's 5 yeah. 10 and three quarters is what he said aren't we all <laughs> <laughs> so so but he has long ass arms for a for a guy yeah. his height he, he does so um okay so 525 bench what do you squat my best squat was 825 um, and <laughs> the thing is like i normally i don't test those very often so right. i'll do things that are like much more difficult 
or like speed oriented with like accommodating resistance bands and chains. So yeah, you know, I could probably do a lot more than those numbers, but those are the numbers that I tested at. Okay. Um, clean. Clean was from 2015. Okay. 180. You did 185? 230 for reps on the high pull. Okay. So that's all, but you did 185 kilos. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that was back in 2015. Yeah. You were just a child back then. <laughs> and okay. What about snatch? Do you snatch and jerk? Uh, yes, I've done a snatch. Um, 140. Okay. So pretty respectable. And then, um, what about jerks? Overhead strength's big for shot putters. I'm sure like overhead presses and jerks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 227 kilos. Damn. That's pretty big. And then, um, what about like, do you do strict military? I, I got to believe like overhead strength's big for rotational throws. A lot of people, I don't think realize that the strength that you have to have to pull or push, you have to be super vertically strong here. The stronger yeah. you are here, the more you can be able to rotate and punch. Um, mm -hmm. so what kind of, uh, what's like a typical workout for you for just what's a, what's your training kind of lifting blocks look like and on a, how many days a week do you lift and kind of yeah. how do you do your splits and stuff? Yeah. So it's basically, it's really simple. It's kind of, um, similar to the conjugate style. So I'll go heavy upper on the Monday. Okay. The day is usually on a Wednesday, heavy lower, and then dynamic effort on the third day, which is usually Friday. Okay. Yeah. And are you just doing three days or do you do a fourth, like a dynamic lower? Not two? Just, but sometimes it'll be, I'll split up the dynamic effort. So okay. it's like max on a Monday, dynamic effort would be on Thursday, and then max on a Tuesday, dynamic effort on a Friday. Okay. But right now it's just three days and that's to accommodate my coaching. Gotcha. And then, um, do you find it, what's your lifting like throughout the season? Do you, when you're in season three mm -hmm. days a week still of yeah. lifting? Yeah. And that works better with all the travel that we have to do. Yeah. I would so. imagine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it seems as though that's a good way in general, right. Especially with travel and just, but re recovery. I think a lot of young athletes get into the habit you know, I, I remember I'd have a really well-designed program for my high school athletes, four day lift, pretty, you know, pretty extensive, lots of throws. And that's a lot of volume for a young guy, but they're younger and they typically recover faster. And then yeah. I find out, you know, they're going to the gym and they're adding in more bench press and they're adding in. And I'm like, guys, you can't train six days a week. You know, it doesn't, your body's never, you're going to, you're going to tap out. So <laughs> how long have you been doing a three day lift? Did that, and at what point did that change? Did it used to be four or five and did it drop down to three or? It was in some periods, it was four days a week. Um, we, but we found the best results with three days a week. Mm -hmm. And my original strength coach, Ross Bowser worked, um, at Westside and, um, he's, you know, he kind of knows conjugate in and out. Right. So funny thing is like, Regardless of what I did, I did more of a triphasic style from like 2016 um, through 2018, but it always comes back to like conjugate base or conjugate principles. So I say that to say that we established that way back in like 2012, and we've made some variations over the years, but it's usually three or four days, hmm. most three days. Okay. And um, what about, I know this is odd since you're talking conjugate, I always, I find it very interesting. I've had good success with my athletes utilizing a lot of that. It makes a lot of sense. Um, what about how much jump work and stuff do you add into your training? Uh, for not too many jumps. Um, I'll put them in like on a lower body dynamic day. So okay. in between my spots, I do some jumps. Um, and the other thing is like, if I want to stay fresh or like on a plyo day, so the, the Tuesday and Thursdays would be more plyo oriented. So like, I'm not just like sitting on the couch. Mm -hmm. That's when I would do some explosive throwing or some jumping and just like general athletic stuff. That's when the speed ladder comes out. Okay. So I do that walking with a sled. So I put the, the jumps in on those two days. Very cool. Do you, um, and what about sprint work and that sort of thing? 
sprints um i'm normally pretty wary of them because like that's an opportunity to hurt yourself so i throw those in at the end of like two of my three throwing sessions a week okay yeah just and then, them. right and is it and, and i'm sure it's not is it all out or is it like 80 percent that's it like yeah they're about 80 percent, maybe even less and the distances aren't too long um, I find a good way to keep yourself safe is maybe put a sled on and that's going to kind of rate limit you a little bit. So, but one thing you don't want to do as a near 300 pound person is go into a dead sprint. Yeah. Especially if you're, you're, you're a powerful guy like myself and my peers, like that's, that's a way to unravel really quickly. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, okay. So that being said on your peer group, you're part of, uh, an interesting time. Like you said, this has been, uh, I mean, an absolute phenomenal time for the men's shot. Um, I mean, throwing as a whole, it's great to see what's going on with like American hammer throwers. Uh, our discus throwers have had good success, but we're still got to get that kind of, I think that international tweak level where they're hitting those same performances. And I have my opinions on that. I think it just has more to do with logistics and the way it kind of goes is kind of my, my, thought on it like they're just i feel like most of the european throwers in the discus get more total meets than american discus throwers. where i feel like american shot putters get a lot of meets um so that's just but um obviously it's it's really uh an amazing time what who who is your like uh who's your favorite throwers of like today's throwers from a technical standpoint i don't know that, that's a hard one <laughs> that's a hard question to answer i don't know now what's it like when you're competing against um uh you know i mean i know it's just another competition and i know it's always about trying to perform at your best but like when you're you're there and obviously ryan is just i mean he's he's obviously the greatest ever but it's his total volume i always say this his total volume of like 22 plus and 22 50 meter throws is just like insane so mm -hmm. what's it like when you're you know you compete against ryan and he's gotten even bigger i mean the guy is he was like kind of skinnier in 2016 right now he's just like he's like a big man now <laughs> he was a tall good size you know definitely was not a small guy but now he's like just massive um so what's it like when you're competing against ryan and and when and obviously some of the things he does technically yeah, I definitely don't watch him uh, closely technically, but um, I mean, it's, it's just another meet. I mean, he's an <laughs> editor. I've seen him through the years. Uh, yeah. We've known each other since the college years. So, right. Uh, it's just another meet. We do our best and then we cheer each other on. That's cool. Yeah. Cause you guys obviously were, um, you were, did he, he graduated in 16 as well? Well, 15 was his last year of outdoor eligibility, right? And he had an indoor year, like 16. Yeah. So that's cool. You guys have definitely known each other a long time. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see what, uh, any other things, uh, mental focus. I had come across a little bit of information and you had, you had just made some quick comment about kind of the, the mental aspect of throwing. I think that's a huge part. And a lot of things that, uh, that's obviously where a good coach really comes in to kind of mm -hmm. keep you in perspective and stuff. But yeah. any kind of big points on like the importance of mental focus and just kind of mental, like, like just general mindset for success in throwing. Um, yeah, for me, I think um, it's huge if you recognize moments for what they are. So if there's a, a big competition, you got to treat it as a big competition and start getting ready for it. You know, not the week of, not the month of, but in the fall, you know, understand the magnitude of it so that when it sneaks up on you and they always do sneak up on you, but it's not a big shock. It's something that's like, it's like a dress, another dress rehearsal for what you've been prepping for. So I think that the mental aspect, you know, is, is key as far as getting yourself ready for the moment. Cause all of these competitions, I tell the high schoolers all the time and even the college kids, like you go one at a time it's a performance more than anything. It's not a head to head battle. Right. So you get yourself ready for the big performance. You go one at a time so that you give 
your best when you can or as as best you can when it counts so yeah the biggest thing is just prep on time and acknowledge the moments for what they are right now you know that said too as you get into that thing and that's the that's that real uh interesting line that a thrower you know rides right you've always got to be kind of keeping it together right so because it doesn't really matter what somebody does but at the same time there are those moments, right, where it's like you and another guy and you're kind of going back and forth. Mm-hmm. How does that, how do you, how do you enjoy that aspect when it is kind of a slug fest where it's like you hit a throw, they hit a, they go five, 10 centimeters more. Now you go up another, you know, you take the lead, that kind of thing. Talk about like that real fast. Yeah, go, I mean, being neck and neck with somebody is always fun. Um, it's fun in the moment and it's even more fun afterwards, you know, because I have not met a single shot putter that's salty after the fact, like we're all, I think we're all good guys. And um, like I've edged out a few people. I, I think I edged out tune day by like a centimeter at Tucson. So like funny stuff like that happens all the time. If I drank a cup of water or if, you know, if he didn't slip on the sidewalk, start, like, you know, all those things come into play and you're talking about centimeters in a sport like shot put. So um, it's always fun. But being in the moment, all you have to do is execute. And sometimes you feel like you can knock down a brick wall based on how training is going or how the throws are going. And sometimes you can see that momentum in another guy. So it's up to you to assess the situation, you know, and live up to it in that spot. But you only have three or six throws to do it, you know? Right. So I guess in that sense, it becomes kind of like a, almost like a contact sport where it's right. you're going, net, net, you know, but um, those are always fun. Even if you got edged out, like nobody likes to lose, but it's like, like, damn, I gave him my best. And that guy, you know, just, right. you know, he, he earned it, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, usually we kind of just do, we talk about all this different stuff and then it's just like, what about you just as Chuck, the person, what do you, what do you like to do in your spare time? Are you a movie guy? Do you like to read music? Yeah. So, um, just in general, I like, I play some video games here and there, um, okay. music and my music taste. I think if anybody has seen me or even like watch the videos I post, like, my music taste is all over the place, um, which is good. I can agree with anybody on something. Right. Uh, and then I read online, but I like to re- like read obscure stuff, like weird animal facts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for that reason, like I'm a big Jeopardy fan. Like that's uh-huh, my favorite. Oh, okay. Besides okay. WWE. And um, eons ago, I wanted to be a WWE superstar one day, but I think it's one of those things where I'd admire more from afar because like they we grind as throwers but those guys are on the road 300 days a year and it's like i couldn't live that lifestyle right but even today i'm a huge wwe geek okay see that's pretty cool um all right so let's see and you're not a movie guy no really i don't think i have the attention span for it (laughs) i'll watch movies and forget everything (laughs) and that's funny that i'd rather be doing instead so and being um, so, uh, so what is life lo- going to look like after throwing? And how how many more years do you think you will be competing? I'm I gotta believe Paris has got to be the goal still. Yeah, so I, I definitely I want to make Paris. Um, I was thinking about being done this year just because, like, I mean, after the the Tokyo Olympics, just because like injuries piling up and stuff and. I'm dealing with one injury that I, I can't really figure out. So, um, I mean, I figured how to throw 70 feet with it, but at the same time, like it, it's kind of unpredictable. So the consistency that I was used to in the previous years, it's not going to be a thing anymore. So that's kind of difficult mentally, gotcha. but, um, I think as long as my weight room numbers are going up and like, I'm still throwing decently far, I might as well just push it till at least the next games before I reassess. Um, and after I retire from throwing, I do want to get into coaching. Hmm. So, cause I just, I feel like I have a lot to offer. Um, not just as far as the technique stuff, but just mindset. Um, and just how to get people to feel good about themselves through throwing. So 
you know, throwing doesn't make you a good person, but the skills you get through throwing can translate into your daily life. So learning how to you know, respect others, like, you know, I'm, I'm always brushing shoulders with guys that are above and below me and the respect stays there. So you gotta be securing yourself. Fitness, like we're 280 and 300 pounds, but we're pretty fit compared to the general population. So stuff like that, self-esteem, like seeing the ball go far or moving heavy weights can make you feel good about yourself. Right. So I, like through my years of doing it at the high school, college, and then now professional level, I have something to offer to that, the next generation. I call them the, the leaders of tomorrow. That's good. So, yeah, for sure. Thank you. That's kind of what, uh, in a parallel way, right? I created our, our coaching system because if we, our goal is, hey, if we're teaching young guys, these are going to be future coaches. And there's so many guys out there that learn terrible stuff. And then they, they, they decide somebody asked them to come help coach and they didn't learn anything. So they're not going to help anybody learn anything. So we wanted to create something that at least gives people a, a rapid understanding of the structure of the throw. Yep. And that way, those next guys, and of course, there's always going to be those people that are um, get grabbed by it, right? And you want to know more and you want to understand and why do I move this way? And what, what happens if my head's here or my change this angle and that kind of stuff. Um, so that would be kind of my last question for you. On that note, um, you get, uh, what, what was it about throwing that sucked you in? Um, so I wanted to get into the weight room. At, high, at my high school and the only way to do that after school was to be a part of a varsity team so I was going to join a sport be it wrestling or you know like I figured it, I'd want something more individual um I probably wasn't built to play basketball so it was either wrestling or track and field and then I think track and field was more accessible gotcha well cool um and what is it specifically about throwing technique to get you hooked on it just the fact that you're the perfect throw doesn't exist but you can get pretty damn close right and the problem is that perfect throw changes with the way you change day to day so it's a constant puzzle it's like you're chasing the dragon and sometimes it's not even going to be perfect the way it looks but it'll feel great you right. know or and then the opposite of that which is kind of scary is when it looks great but it doesn't go you know <laughs> so you always want to get a grasp on the current situation and throwing like training your technique and even like your fitness and stuff like that like right. you can always put pieces to that puzzle together in different ways very cool what uh if you go like on foods tacos or wings wings okay um Tacos or burgers? Tacos. Okay. <laughs> I got to get tacos in there. <laughs> um, favorite pump up song? Um, Price of Fame by Michael Jackson. Price of Fame by Michael Jackson. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. Favorite rock band? Rock. So it depends on what you consider rock. Um, like I consider Panic of the Disco rock. Okay. So that would be. We'll go, we'll go class. Yeah. That's a little more poppy, right? Panic at the disco alternative poppy. So mm -hmm. we'll go, we'll go classic, classic rock. Class. Oof. That'd be difficult. That'd be difficult. Um, I've come by a lot of ACDC. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of a good classic rock one. All right. I'm old. So classic is maybe subjective, you know, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> um let's see uh favorite rap song Ooh, all eyes on me tupac okay yeah that's classic right there <laughs> okay that is a good one um let's see uh are you a sweets guy yeah okay because i'd seen something you'd mentioned about diet so mm -hmm. what's your your go-to healthy meal Mm -hmm. and what and what's your go-to cheat meal go to a healthy meal um rice and beef just rice with a side of beef light seasoning um go to cheat meal I, i'm a sucker for oreos 
Oreos, huh? That's funny. Stay all night. <laughs> all right. And then um, let's see. Favorite type of pizza? Um, I just get from pizza. So being from New York, like the weird thing, I'm not a pizza connoisseur. I was, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I just, I get basic pizza hut with the uh, garlic crust and garlic, <laughs> stuff, you know, pepperonis on it. That's it. Okay. So. Best place to eat in West Lafayette. <laughs> it's not a whole lot in West Lafayette. <laughs> There's really not a lot of West Lafayette. Best place to eat, and you're from Queens, right? Mm -hmm. What's the best place? I know that's a big area, but. Mm -hmm. There's a place right by my high school called Fat Boys Pizza. Mm. Yeah, so they, they had a bunch of weird uh, weird flavors that kind of hit. So they had a buffalo um, chicken pizza, mm. which sound as good as it tastes. Yeah, it doesn't sound as good, but it was good, huh? Yeah. Okay, any just general suggestions or advice you would give young throwers and young coaches? Yeah, uh, well, for young throwers, just stay the course. Um, you can see even from my progression that there's some ebbs and flows. There's highs and lows and stuff like that. But even if you're having a hard time or like you're in a little bit of a slump, there's a way out of it some way, somehow. So just like it sounds corny, but stay the course. Um, if you quit, you can't get out of it. So just keep, keep working and eventually you'll find an answer to the young coaches. Just like, I'm a young coach. So kind of, but um, I think be patient Yeah, and just look for those highlight moments to where an athlete feels good about a throw or um, I think one of the biggest things for me is when an athlete gets that light bulb moment, mm -hmm. you can see that they understand what you're saying, whether they can do it or not. You're right. But you that they understand like for me that's the most fulfilling feeling in the world yeah no that's definitely cool i i i i definitely do this it's fun i get excited about that kid who busts 30 feet in the shot you know yeah. guy or girl and there's just whatever barrier 30 40 50 60 you know i've had i've been lucky to have a few 70 foot shot putters and uh you know i was just excited about the kid throwing 35 feet as i was about the kid throwing you know 70 feet so um but uh yeah no that's awesome and uh um thanks so much man i hopefully uh i tried to do i, I i'm getting my kinking out my uh my process but it's always just really insightful to love talking to you guys and hearing about it again congratulations on all the success it's it's like a, you got a pretty impressive rap sheet now you've been ranked top 10 in the world uh i really hope to see you you know get healthy. Cause I know that's a really important thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'd love to see you hit that 22 meters and that would be, you know, a nice way to, to, to keep things rolling. So get healthy for sure. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, have you ever looked into the one by 20 stuff? No, it's, uh, yes. He was all him, him and Dr. B were good buddies. So he does okay. this one by 20 method and it's basically it's up to 20 exercises, one set of 20 reps. So from one to 15, you mm -hmm. basically get a kind of a strength endurance, but from 15 to 20, you elicit a 85 to 95% 1RM type of load. Mm -hmm. And because you're only doing one set, it's really key for joint tendon strength. Well, wow. and so all these coaches have done a lot of really research on it. Yes, this is like I said, he was like Dr. B's. He's like the guy really almost responsible for bringing a lot of Dr. B's information to the States. And he was really close with Bunderchuk. So it's just an interesting thing. So a lot of guys who are having like chronic nagging injuries, and I know you you know, I'm familiar with conjugate, mm -hmm. but what it'll do is kind of sometimes shift gears. And your initial thought is I'm doing 20 reps. How the hell am I going to get strong? But these guys all show that the you start to do, you have like a more advanced workout would be like a unilateral day and a bilateral day. So yeah. you're doing more exercises. So you hit more body parts and you allow recovery. You get this real good uh, results. And all these really successful coaches have reported like drops in 40 times, six inch improvements in verticals, big strength gain still, because these athletes are like shoring up a lot of technical issues, weaknesses, 
and they're really kind of just giving the body an opportunity to build that tendon ligament strength. So it's something you might want to check into just if you're oh. having kind of chronic injury. And if you've been <clears> doing <throat> conjugate for a while, it's one of those things that you can, and I know it's scary because I have one of my athletes who's an advanced guy, um, Jason Harrell. I don't know if you know, Jason discus thrower. He's, he threw 65, 48, a couple of years ago. He's got, he's getting married. This is his final year. He's 31. Yeah. Um, and he's been always ready to throw well. And then he gets, he's had these recurring little naggy injuries, weird shit that just shouldn't yeah. happen. And, uh, we put him on it and it's like shockingly how well he's actually performing. So we're doing it in an attempt to not, not have him have these weird, cause he'll be training great. He doesn't get like major, there's no back issues. There's no shoulder issues. No, he'll, he'll strain his adductor. He'll strain his, his hip flexor. He'll get straight. So he's always had this quad adductor hip thing going on. And every year we're like going great. And it's like a week before nationals, he'll get a strain. You know, okay. the year he threw 65, 48, he couldn't take any full throws at hundred percent seven days prior to the U S championships Wow! because he had pulled it. So he still, he finished eighth that year, but it was like, he was throwing lights out. Like he probably would have, he would have been, in a really good spot to be that was an amazing year in the men's discus though so even if he had a great year i think it was like sam was sam mattis was what third at 66 but at any rate the point of that was is uh the one by 20 might be something you might want to check into there's a lot of really good info on it okay. and it's a way to get that that you you basically it's a way of getting your body to repair strengthen and kind of clean up imbalances so you can start pushing again without any injury so something to think about. I appreciate that. I'll look into it. Yeah. So it, cause for me as a strength guy and a coach and everything, I was kind of like, so I was talking to some people and I brought in some people to give me some opinions on stuff. And I was like, man, I, this seems like such a departure, but the more and more you dig into it, you're like, okay, this is totally making sense. And then there's a lot of validation on it. And then I've been doing it with some of my guys and it's like, yeah, I'm actually seeing that they're throwing well, they're moving well, they're healthy. They feel good. They're recovered. Mm -hmm. so it's it's working so we're doing okay. it all right man well hey i really appreciate it congratulations again on all this success i appreciate the generosity of your time thanks so much and i hope to yep. see you at tucson we'll work on it <laughs> okay all right buddy take care yeah bye. okay bye-bye